Hello and welcome back to the MFX Modules series, a collection of useful little mini Houdini setups for those who want to get their knowledge on. As always, support is much appreciated. Please like, subscribe, and check the video description for links to any relevant project files. Module 2 will cover the basic attribute wet map technique. We'll learn how we can use a solver to stick attributes to our geometry and look at a couple practical examples of it in use. So let's dive in and check it out. So let's just start with a grid and a sphere. I'm gonna throw down a grid. I'm gonna dive inside the grid and throw down a remesh here. And we'll set that to target size of 0 0.05. Hit spacebar F to frame that up and let's throw it on a sphere. And I'm going to uh, animate the sphere across our grid. So let's throw it on a transform and I'll grab the um, manipulator here and let's move this handle over here and I'm going to just alt click on the translation. Then maybe I'll go to frame 48 and move the handle there. I'll click translate again, and then move the handle to frame 96 and move it over here and alt click translate once more. So we've got our sphere moving sort of along this path. I'm just gonna turn on the real time toggle so we can see that playback in real time. So it's gonna kind of move across our grid like that. So now if we wanna transfer some sort of a mask or wet map from our animated geometry onto our mesh here, um, the usual workflow is something like uh, using a attribute transfer, you could use mask from geometry. Um, and this is a nice node that's very convenient for this type of thing. And if we visualize the mask attribute, let's just hit the info key and tap mask. You can see that it's transferring that data for us, which is cool. I actually like to use the attribute transfer because in really heavy setups, I found this node can be a little bit heavy when there is a time dependency coming into it. So you can see this little green clock that is appearing here represents a time dependency that's coming from the animation on our transform. So to minimize slowness and maximize performance, I'm going to throw down a attribute transfer instead. It's the fastest way I've found to create a mask from an object. So let's create first two attributes, one on the left stream and one on the right stream. So I'm going to set the attribute to mask. We're going to say attribute create and we'll wire this in on the left. And the attribute I want to create is mask. And I'm going to initialize it to zero on this left stream. And I'm just going to alt drag this off to the right, wire it in and initialize it to one on the right stream. So if we do something like an attribute transfer, we should be able to see something similar happening if we get our settings dialed in, right? I'm just going to, I'm going to untick primitives and under points. I'm going to select the mask attribute. And then I think our mask visualizer is off. So I'm just going to right click on this little Google Maps pin icon looking thing and tap the mask. And you can see that everything turns red because this attribute transfer is set up to transfer everything by, through a distance to threshold of 10, which is a little bit much. So I'm just gonna bring that down and maybe give it a little bit of a blend width like so. Maybe I'll add just a little bit of distance threshold in there, something like that. Just so we can kind of see, okay, we're actually doing the attribute transfer. It's good, it's, it's fast and great but we want this to stick around. So the next thing we gotta do is throw this in a solver. I'm just going to throw down a solver first. So solver, and I'm going to grab this node and hit control X and dive inside the solver and hit control V. So we've got our attribute transfer all set up inside here. And I'm gonna wire in the first two inputs like so. Now, nothing's coming into our solver yet. We gotta actually wire this stuff in. So I'm going to wire in the, the, the thing I'm transferring to on the left and the thing I'm transferring from is gonna come in on the right. Now, if we dive inside our solver and look, you can see on this frame, we've got the same thing going on here. Now, what we're actually outputting is this over here. So what we need to do is actually incorporate what's going on here and compare what was going on in the previous frame to determine whether we should still be activated or not. So we're gonna throw down a wrangle. And on this stream, 
right here, we're going to compare to what's going on in the previous frame. And then I'll just wire this into the output. Now we just need to write some very basic vex here in order to accomplish this. And basically what we're gonna do is look at this second input here and determine what the mask value is on the second input. So to do that, we can type float mask previous. So mask prev equals point. So the point function is going to look at the second input right here, so one and we're gonna look up the value of the mask attribute, so mask in quotes, and we're gonna do it for every point number, so at pt num. And that'll give us uh, our mask attribute stored as a variable here, and then what we can do is compare it. So we wanna make sure that our mask that we are currently on on this frame is the maximum of whatever our current mask is and whatever the mask was on the previous frame. So I'm gonna say that at mask, so f at mask equals max, of our current mask, f at masks, and our previous mask, so mask prev, like so. And now if I jump out and put this back to zero and press play, you can see that as the sphere moves across our plane, it is actually accumulating that wet map, if you will. One thing I wanted to make quick note of is, notice how I jumped out of the solver here um, and am up here in SOPs. Uh, observing the results of the solver, that's kind of something that you need to be mindful of when you're working inside a solver. You might think that you could rely on what kind of preview you're getting inside here, but if I rewind this and play it, it's kind of, it may or may not work. So right now it actually is accumulating that attribute and playing back our wet map the way we would expect it to, but sometimes this can cause problems. Uh, so what I like to do is often, you know, I'll be working in here and then I'll hop up here and make sure that I have my solver selected up on this level to observe what's going on. Other things I'll do is pin what I've got going on up here. So I'm just gonna pin my viewport so that when I jump inside, I know that I'm actually still viewing it from the SOP level instead of inside of this solver. So it's just a quick note about that. I'm just gonna untick the pin right here before we move on. So there are a ton of use cases for a thing like this. Um, it's always handy to be able to track, you know, when an object has been at a certain location and having it affect that geometry in a certain way. For example, tracking the movement of a character and their footprints, creating little footprints in the snow and using this mask to deform the uh, surface geometry of the ground to make it look like, you know, the character is leaving behind a trail. Another example would be the classic namesake of why a wet map is called a wet map in the first place, which is, you know, a wet object hits a surface and causes glossiness to appear on the texture. So you could take this attribute and feed it into the shader of whatever this grid is and use it to adjust how glossy that material is. Let's take a look at a couple of these examples here. This is the snow example, and I'm just gonna step through this file and we can kind of look at it together. Um, but if you wanna dive in a little bit deeper or tinker around with it, this uh, file will be available um, and there will be a link in the description of this video. So let's take a look at this. We'll just play this back. You can see Crag here is walking through uh, what looks like some, you know, maybe some powder, some snow, and creating a nice little uh, trail behind him right there. So really this is the same setup that we were using before. Um, I am just transferring this attribute here. Uh, everything is more or less the same. We've just swapped out the geometry for some other type of animated geometry. So once this is done simulating, I'll uh, kind of back it up and we can kind of look through this network and see how it's all formed. You can see that we're just doing this attribute transfer inside the solver. Everything here is the same as what we just did in the previous example. And then what I'm doing is I'm taking Crag, I'm unpacking them, and then I'm actually just subdividing and adding a little bit of extra geometry to the hammer here because the hammer is a little bit low poly. If I turn on smooth wire shade, you can see that without the subdivide, there aren't as many points, but with the subdivide, it just adds some more points that gives it some more points to perform our attribute transfer inside of the solver a little bit better. So then after the solver, I'm just putting it into a wrangle and the wrangle is just taking the mask value and piping it through a ramp and then just multiplying it. So I can just change the height of these footsteps using this little thing right here. And then this little ramp just adds like a little lip to the edge of it and you can kind of control how that falls off like so. So that's how a wet map could be useful for creating footsteps in the snow like that. The next example file uh, is more of the classic wet map that you would see with raindrops. So let's take a look at this here. I'm just gonna turn this on and 
let's flag the raindrops and we can take a look at this. Let's click play. So you got raindrops falling and then you can see that the raindrops are landing on this grid and then um, rippling down. So let's go through this setup and kind of see how this works. What I've done here is I've added, I've tilted the grid that we had on its side. I've added a few more points, not by increasing the remesh, but just by subdividing it a little bit further using loop mode. I find that that's sometimes a little bit quicker than doing another level of remeshing. Um, and then I've added the mask as usual here. So we've initialized our mask to zero. Then over here, we've added another grid and put it above the other grid so that our raindrops can fall down from here onto the grid and wired that into a pop net. And you can see that this grid is going into the second input of the pop net, which will um, be used as a collider inside the pop net. So let's dive in here. And you can see that going from left to right, We've got our static object here, which is looking at the second incoming geometry noted by that little one right there. And I've set it to use surface collisions for this example. Then over here on the pop object, the pop object's bounce has been set to zero to make it so that the raindrops, they don't bounce off and kind of fly away in projectile motion. They just sort of like hit this grid and slide. So that's what that does. Then up here at the pop source node, you can see that we're sourcing in on the first context geometry. So that first stream that's coming in right here. And then we are uh, just telling it to birth 100 per second, how many particles per second are going to be emitted into the scene. And then here I'm just adding a, a pop force with a little bit of noise. I've just added some amplitude here. That just gives the raindrops a little bit more character as they're sliding down the surface. And then here on the pop solver, I think I left everything as default. And down here, I just added gravity. So if we hop back out, you can see that our particles are simply falling and hitting the grid and sliding off like so. Now, the result of this, I'm, I'm giving this the mask. I'm initializing a mask value of one like we did in our previous example. And then uh, here, I'm actually adding a trail. So if I turn the trail off and we look at our, our solver here, we can kind of see what it looks like. If we look real closely and sim this, without the trail on, we get some really bad stepping for some of these really fast moving particles. But if I turn the trail on, you can see that it actually helps us smooth that out. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just adding points in between um, each time step. So if we look a little bit closer at the trail, you can see that with the trail, we've got a bunch of dots traveling through the air like so. It almost looks like we're just kind of baking motion blur into our setup. What we're doing here is taking the trail increment and dividing one by the trail increment. That's basically, so if we're taking our trail increment as 0.1, that means we're going to be getting 10 because we're dividing one by 0.1, which gives us 10. That means we're gonna get 10 steps in between each frame. So if I adjust the size of this trail increment, you can see I'm increasing and decreasing the number of points that are kind of shoved into the um, distance between frames. So it's gonna set that back to one. Now. It's kind of a subtle thing, I don't know if you notice it, but if we look at our solver and we click play, you can actually see that these water droplets are fading a little bit. They fade out as they run down. You can see that it's actually just got a little bit of decay built into it. And I was able to get that by just adding one little line of X inside of here. And so if we dive inside of our solver and zoom in, I just have added this right here. I'm gonna rename this and make it, uh, call it decay, because that's what this is. If we look at our wrangle right here, we're just taking our mask and multiplying it by one minus this decay value. If our decay is 0.05 and we're doing one minus 0.05, that basically means we're multiplying our mask by 0.95 every frame. So every frame, it's going to be slightly less and less and less. Now, if I increase this value to something like 0.3 and go back and plus press play, you can see that these drops are very short. Now, this actually isn't a representation of what's really going on. This is one of those examples where things can be kind of weird when you're inside a solver, but trying to view the results of the solver. So if I go back up here onto the SOP level and I rewind the simulation, I'm going to control shift, click the brain to reset the simulation and click play you can see that we do get trails again. So if I'm gonna be adjusting something like this, a lot of times what I'll do is I will pin this uh, view and then dive into the solver and then I can crank this decay value around and watch 
the effect that it's having on the results of the solver without having to go up and down so much. So I'm going to bring it back down to, I did have it up at a higher value, let's say a value of 0.8. You can see we're getting really short trails that almost are just kind of fading out even before they even start to exist. And then if I bring this way down to a value of 0.2, trails are a little bit longer. So that's kind of a fun uh, little setup. You could then take this attribute, this point attribute, and feed it into a shader and have it drive, you know, maybe the transparency or the roughness of, uh, of a piece of glass or something like that. Again, this project file will be um, available in the link in the description below if you want to dive in a little bit deeper. So hopefully that was informative. Hopefully that was fun. And I will see you in the next lesson.